Welcome to lecture number one for the Kinesiology 4130 Foods and Nutrition class. This is the introductory lecture for the course. We will cover chapter one in Fink. We're not getting into dark side of fat loss in this lecture at all. Um, and it's really a chapter that just kind of covers the basics and introduces us to the field of nutrition and sport nutrition and some of the things that we're going to cover in much more depth throughout the rest of the term. Some of the learning outcomes for this lecture include defining nutrition and sport nutrition, uh, introducing the six classes of nutrients, uh, what they are, kind of what they're all about, just a little bit, um, and even discussing briefly what the relationship is between nutrition and wellness. So ultimately, why is nutrition important? Uh, some things to explain about this class before we get into the material. Um, yeah, we get into the science of metabolism and human performance as they're related to nutrition. There is that natural relationship. Uh, you can't discuss one without the other for sure. I know most of you are kinesiology majors, so this should all very much be up your alley. Um, nutrition is absolutely much more than simply meeting caloric and nutrient guidelines or goals. And this is where a lot of this class will separate from Fink, meaning that the Fink textbook is very much a traditional nutrition textbook where discussions do revolve mostly around, yeah, if you're an athlete, you need X number of calories and X number of vitamins and minerals or whatever else it might be, um, and doesn't go beyond where they're coming from, the quality of the source and how there might be interactions between certain foods and nutrients with other things that you do. And so I'm going to try and present to you some of those factors that exist outside of the Fink textbook. And that's one of the reasons that we're using the dark side of fat loss. Um, everything from the source of the food, how it's eaten, where it's eaten, and even how it's eliminated will have an impact on our health. And that's that area that I'm going to try and introduce and discuss with all of you through this course. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, and it's said in multiple ways, but it always means the same kind of thing. Food can be the most powerful medicine or the slowest poison, and it's your choice, right? So one of my goals for you at the end of this class is to have an understanding of how to choose the right foods to eat and choose them um, and, and avoid those that act as the slowest poison. And some of those foods and some of those choices are obvious, but some of them aren't. And so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share information about those types of decisions and you'll leave with a better understanding of what the right thing to do is uh, regarding nutritional choices. All right, uh, we have to define nutrition. Surely you've all heard of the term before and have an idea of what nutrition is. Uh, you know, it's not super complex. There's a couple of textbook definitions that I'll share with you, or at least this one. Um, you know, the science of food, the nutrients, the substances therein, their action, interaction, and balance in relationship to health and disease, and the process by which the organism ingests, absorbs, transports, utilizes, and excretes food substances. Oh my goodness, right? That's a massive description of what nutrition is, and it's all-encompassing, right? It basically has everything to do with the foods that you choose to eat, how you eat them, what happens when, to them once you eat them, and how you get rid of them. Um, and that truly is the, the purpose or the outcome of this class, is to investigate all those different aspects of what nutrition is. Uh, for those of you who follow along the... Uh, components of wellness, right? You often see certain wellness related pies like this one, a pie chart that has those different components. Yes, nutrition would be part of that physical component of health, right? And so for someone to reach a level of optimum wellness, surely nutrition plays a role in that aspect. But then again, in the bigger picture, we can't ignore those other pieces of the wellness pie. Um, you know, those are all included up there. So sport nutrition, we've identified or defined general nutrition. So how does sport nutrition differ, right? And again, you've all surely probably thought of this in some way. Um, this class does have that sport nutrition twist, right? Or add on, right? Or emphasis, right? We, we will cover general nutrition, but there is a sport nutrition aspect. As kinesiology majors, um, how do we apply nutritional information to athletic performance? And that's where sport nutrition really uh, begins. How do we utilize the information that we understand about nutrition? And then on the other side, your understanding of human physiology, human performance, all those factors that go into that, and how do we put them together to create the ultimate outcome, the ultimate athlete, the ultimate performance. So um, 
textbook definitions, yeah, you can read them on your own, um, but it is this combination of the nutrition world and the sporting science world. Um, the application of nutritional knowledge in, in the context of sport nutrition, um, there are often specific goals that or categories of goals related to sport nutrition. Those are at the bottom of the page here. Uh, things like making sure that fuel for physical activity is adequate, right? Undernourished athletes, um, especially in a chronic sense, can lead to, to disaster. Uh, facilitating the repair and rebuilding process following physical work. We'll cover that in great detail throughout this class. Um, general, yeah, optimize athletic performance. What type of nutritional needs does an athlete have to best perform, be most successful at their given event or sport? Um, and then lastly, yeah, to promote health and wellness. And, you know, sometimes in this context of sporting and sporting performance, that last bullet is ignored. And if an athlete is more likely to get sick, their immune system's compromised because of, well, because of their training and other lifestyle factors and their nutrition isn't supporting it, um, that loss of health and wellness can ultimately affect their performance. So that is definitely an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, so I, I mentioned in the introduction a little bit about my role as the sport nutritionist at St. Mary's College for the last decade or so. Um, one of the things I share with the athletes is this sort of optimum performance pie, right? It's like, why do we care about nutrition? Why are you even talking to us? Um, and you know, this is not, this is not too different than that wellness sort of components of wellness pie, right? But you know, what makes the ultimate athlete and nutrition is an important part of creating or becoming the best that somebody can be right and when we look at sport and sport performance um you know there is psychology there's rest and recovery coaching obviously has is a huge piece of the puzzle as is training but ultimately yeah, nutrition plays a role in that process and when nutrition is ignored um performance will suffer just as if you ignored any of those other components of this optimum performance pie so uh, so that is sort of nutrition's place in that bigger context of uh, athletic performance. Uh, one last thing about the the nature of this class, you know, I often will just loosely refer to as athletes and what type of athlete, and, you know, what the needs of certain athletes are and all that. You know, in my viewpoint, an athlete by definition is basically anybody who exercises quite a bit, whether or not you're exercising just for health or for com competitive reasons. I know there's a massive spectrum, um, but really from the fitness enthusiasts to the competitive, you know, college division one, division two athletes, top level stuff, right? Um, to me, you're athletes, right? Again, there doesn't have to be a competitive aspect to it or even a sport aspect to it. Um as we get into this class, we'll identify the differences in needs from across that spectrum, right? Hey, someone who doesn't exercise much, this is what their needs are compared to somebody who is a top level performer who's training four, five, six hours a day kind of uh, comparison. All right, getting into another sort of big picture question, are you what you eat? One of my favorites and one that's always good to have a discussion with face to face in this online environment eh, not maybe not the best but think about it for a second are you what you eat you surely have heard somebody say that you are what you eat right um you know literally of course not is the answer um and as you think about it right what makes us what we are ultimately when we look at it as, at ourselves as a physical in a physical sense right and even in a performance sense um we are a byproduct of what we fuel ourselves with, what we put in our bodies. So saying we are what we eat, yeah, we are a byproduct. We are a functioning representation of what we put in our body, whether it's foods or supplements or whatever it is, right? Um, so when we talk about nutrition, the, asking the question, are you what you eat? Of course, literally, I don't think so. Yeah, you don't eat a carrot, you don't become a carrot. However, the nutrition that a carrot may provide that ultimately fuels cells and affects metabolism or whatever else it might do, then yes, we are a product of how good or what was in that carrot, right? So then, yeah, okay, a little bit more in a metaphorical sense, I believe we are absolutely are what we eat. Um, you know, you can compare people who eat really well, and defining eating really well is another tricky one, right? But people who eat really well can be compared to people who don't, there's a difference. Health and performance will be affected by what you eat. So um, again, always a good discussion point. All right. When we get into the details of nutrition specifically, there is this term called nutrients, right? This category of elements that have multiple properties. So nutrients as a category 
are things that provide us with energy. Not all nutrients provide us energy, um, and not all things that provide us energy are nutrients. So there's a little bit of um, gray area there. But most nutrients, we're talking carbs, fats, proteins, yeah, they provide us with energy. Um, they provide us with building blocks. And building blocks is a really vague term to just basically say, yeah, they provide us with the elements needed to create or form molecules or structures, however, whatever level you want to talk about it, systems in our body for us to function optimally. So the nutrients that we consume go into making bigger and stronger muscles, whatever, whatever tissue or, or organ you want to talk about. Um, nutrients are vital for growth and maintenance. So these are nutrients that are vital for our health, our overall function. Um, nutrients are what is called essential. And this is, again, there is some gray area in that, but think something that is essential in the context of nutrition refers to a product or a substance that the body cannot make for itself or can't make it fast enough. And so we'll talk about things. It's like our body can make, uh, you know, certain amino acids. It's fantastic. It's wow. We're short in amino acid. Yeah. Let's sacrifice some of these other amino acids and we can make that one that we're short on, but the body can't make specific amino acids we talk we call those the essential amino acids and we'll get to all that later right um and those are essential because the body can't make them and so we have to consume them through the diet and so that's the term essential when when it's tagged on to or attached to any description of a nutrient or a product means that we have to consume it our body can't take care of that nutrient on its own so the six general classes of nutrients and some people list them in different ways some people don't include water which i think is a shame because it is the most essential of all these on the list um so the six classes of nutrients are often subcategory subcategorized into macronutrients and micronutrients the macronutrients are those nutrients that we need in large amounts carbohydrates fats proteins and water carbohydrates fats and proteins as you probably already know do provide us with energy water does not um, carbohydrates, when we get to the carbohydrates chapter, we'll get all into the details of this, can be argued that they are not essential. We can thrive without carbohydrates in our diet. However, it's still generally accepted that carbohydrates are essential uh, for us to consume. Uh, the micronutrients are those nutrients that we need in much smaller amounts. Vitamins and minerals are those two micronutrient categories. So vitamins and minerals, as you know, right, a little vitamin pill like this is like, you know, a thousand percent of your daily need of a whole handful of vitamins and possibly minerals um you need much more of that than the macronutrients right fats proteins carbohydrates you know we're talking platefuls um every day to keep you healthy and, and thriving so the micronutrients are those nutrients that we need in much smaller amounts doesn't mean that their role isn't any less important because of that volume it just means that we need them in smaller amounts Oh, another huge question that's always worth discussing in detail when we're face to face. Why is nutrition important? Why are you taking this class? Why do we care about what we eat? Why can't we just eat whatever? And it seems to work for some people. Yeah, I eat whatever the heck is in front of me and I'm fine, right? Is there a relationship between nutrition and health? And hopefully all of you are going, yeah, no kidding, right? Yes, of course there is. Um, if we don't eat enough of certain nutrients, we will suffer consequences that are associated with deficiency diseases. Um, in our country, in the U.S., not very prominent anymore. However, because of the declining quality of our food supply, some nutrient deficiencies are showing up. We see people ending up having B12 deficiencies, which were gone for years and years, and because of food choices and food processing and taking vitamins out of foods in the processing of them. Uh, we see people starting to show up with certain vitamin and mineral deficiencies when they didn't exist before. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, that relationship between nutrition and inadequate consumption um, isn't a big issue in our country. On the flip side, overnutrition can be a problem, right? Consuming too much of certain things can lead to issues associated with being over fat and the complications with obesity are numerous, right? And so there is that relationship between nutrition and uh, obesity, without a doubt. There's relationship between nutrition and other diseases, things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancers. The list is actually quite long, right? So nutrition, ultimately, to answer this question, and there's no right or wrong way necessarily to answer it. Yeah, think about the impact that good and or bad nutrition might have on someone's 
short-term and long-term health outcomes. What could eating a purely sugar-based diet do to somebody um, in a day? Eh, maybe not much, but maybe over years and years and years, we start to see things like diabetes and heart disease and, and those cancers and all those other things start to show up. So um, yeah, so nutrition is critical. It is that most powerful medicine or that slowest poison. It is important because it can make us healthy or it can make us sick. I spend this slide talking about nutrition research, and we don't get into too many specific articles in this class, to be honest. There's so much material as it is. I don't like to bombard you with too much. I want to keep it manageable, right? But I want to at least point this out because we do at least a, a discuss certain types of outcomes of research. And so in the world of nutrition, research is tricky. Um, there's two general categories of nutrition research, neither of which is perfect by any means. Um, the first one is that the epidemiological studies. These are fantastic for multiple reasons. These are usually large-scale studies. We're talking hundreds, if not thousands of people. We follow them over time. Hey, we've been tracking this group of individuals for 20 years. Um, oh my gosh, we should know everything now about the outcomes of what they're doing to themselves, right? Of course we do. The problem with these epidemiological studies, and there's a lot of them out there and they're published all the time, is that there is no intervention, right? We can't follow 5,000 people for 20 years and control what they eat or control what they do for exercise or control what some of their other lifestyle habits are regarding sleep and stress and use of, you know, things like tobacco and all that kind of stuff, right? So these epidemiological studies are great because we have massive numbers of people to follow. The problem with them is that we don't know much about what they do other than you, and these are usually survey based type of studies where they go, okay, you know, every month you fill out a survey, talk about your food choices, talk about maybe some of your lifestyle habits and whatever else. And the researchers get together and go, oh my gosh, look, this group that happened to eat at McDonald's the most, more than any other group, right? The people who ate there the most statistically had this health outcome. So we're going to conclude that eating at McDonald's, as an example, had that health outcome. Do we know it was McDonald's that made this group have that consequence? No. It could have been that they just happened to also do some other things. So without getting into too, too many random sort of examples, the, the outcomes of these epidemiological studies are just observational and they aren't necessarily causal, meaning we don't have a cause and effect relationship. They're just looking at relationships going, well, it is more likely if you eat at McDonald's to have that type of disease. Is it McDonald's that's causing it? Maybe, maybe not. So it's kind of a shot not shot in the dark, a shot in the light, but still just sort of taking a guess. Um, on the flip side, clinical studies. These are fantastic for other reasons that the epidemiological studies aren't. We can control what people do in these clinical studies. As a matter of fact, we try to control everything. We typically in clinical studies will feed subjects, hey, we're going to give you a high carbohydrate diet for six weeks. We're not going to let you choose anything that you want to eat, and we're going to see what happens to you over those six weeks of eating the high carb diet. Um, is that good? Yeah, of course it is. We can see the physiological changes. We know that they're not going off and having, you know, cigarettes or, or all stressed out, whatever it is, right? We know that there aren't external variables affecting them, right? We're trying to control for that. These are usually hospital-based settings, not always. Um, and so we have absolute control of individuals. The problem with these types of study in the, studies in the nutrition world I think they're really limited in their duration. It takes more than six weeks, even a couple of months, even six months to really see some effects of changes in eating behavior. So quite often you'll see, hey, we followed this group of individuals for two months and we put them on a high fat diet, let's say. And hey, after the two months, nobody died of heart disease. So high fat diets must not be bad for your heart, right? Is that a fair conclusion? Well, everything was controlled for. We knew they ate, ate high-fat diets. Nobody died. Nobody got heart disease even, let's say. So is that a good conclusion? Well, based on their observations, yes. But we also know that something like a heart disease doesn't develop in such a short time. And we need to follow them for longer amounts of time. But usually the resources aren't there to do it. Right? You can't turn humans into lab rats. So that's the, the drawback of the clinical side of this equation. So... Way too much time on talking about that, but just be mindful that the epidemiological studies, 
sometimes a little bit too much of a shot in the dark, even though it's not quite in the dark. Uh, clinical, it's too controlled, which means they're too short. So, all right, let's get back to talking about diets. Um, so a good question to, to ask is, you know, what's a healthy diet? Like, how do we define it? How are we going to go about this semester of going, yeah, okay, when I get, when we get to the end of this term, I want you to be able to tell me, yeah, this is a healthy diet. And and also tell me why. So um, first and foremost, and I should have made that first comment there in red, there is no one size fits all diet. If there was, we'd have it and everyone would be eating it, right? So over the millennia, over the decades of, you know, over the centuries, I guess, probably of nutritional sort of attempts to come up with the perfect diet, we know that there isn't one. We absolutely know that there isn't one. We'll talk about it. There's a chapter on the dark side of fat loss. I believe it's chapter three, the do what healthy people do chapter. It's fantastic, and it helps identify that, yeah, there is no one-size-fits-all diet. Certain individuals thrive on certain types of diets. Sometimes it's based on their genetics. Sometimes it's based on just them. Um, sometimes it's based on their environment and where they are traditionally, you know, where they live. So, um, so there is no one-size-fits-all diet. So then how do we approach improving someone's dietary choices if we know that there isn't one way to go about doing it? And so... There's certain tools to use. I love the four bullets down at the bottom of the page here. Balance, variety, moderation, and real. Um, and so every diet needs to have certain components, and they can all be defined differently, right? But, you know, something in, in terms of balance, right? We need to have a balance of the macronutrients. That may be different. That will be different for everyone. Hey, I'm on a high-carb diet, which means I'm pretty much low-fat and maybe moderate protein. That's my balance. Um, some people might be low-carb with high-fat and moderate protein, whatever it is. But that balance needs to be the balance that is best for that individual. And that sometimes takes some trial and error and understanding the individual's physiology and their needs and all that. Um, variety is another important one. So the diet needs to be varied. And by that, I mean we benefit most from obtaining our nutrients from different food sources, right? So you could design the perfect one-day meal plan. Yep, I'm having eggs and bacon for breakfast. I'm having a salad for lunch and I'm having a piece of fish with pasta for dinner. That's perfect. And that's all I need to eat every day. It meets my macronutrient needs and it meets, meets my micronutrient needs. That's great. But when we eat the same exact thing every day, we are surely to be going to be missing some nutrients in that process that's not to say that you can't get really close and yeah okay um we don't need to eat a varied diet because i have designed the one that has all the nutrients in it generally speaking we need to get foods from different sources to provide a balance or a, a multitude of or the best opportunity maybe is the best way to say it, the best opportunity to get all the macro micronutrients that we need from different food sources so um so variety is important uh, moderation, we need to eat the right amounts. Not too little, not too much. Again, understanding what that is is a whole nother process, right? Um, and then finally, real. And I put real in bold caps and underline because that's the most important factor. We need to eat real food. And if we choose food that is the least modified, the least processed, the closest to being in its natural state, we are going to be a lot better off. So that ultimately is the most important factor of those four. Hey, my people ask me quite often like hey you know I, what would be your best advice for someone to eat the best diet like what would be the quickest way for you to describe that this is my answer if you lived on an acre of land you grew all your food fruits vegetables grains and raised all the any animals that you wanted to eat whether it's chickens cows pigs whatever it is the food that you grow on your acre of land would be the best diet. I don't care how much of whatever of those things you eat, what you're growing is natural. Surely you're not going to spray your food with chemicals and pump your pigs full of hormones, right? So we're going to talk, we're talking about natural, real food grown. You're not going to be able to eat anything that's out of season or, or been refrigerated for six months in terms of waiting to be, you know, ripe and eaten by you. So there is that type of ultimate scenario. Any deviation from it, is a downgrade and that's obviously not a realistic situation not all of us have the means to grow our own food but that's the starting point you could only grow real stuff you're not going to take any grains that you grow and bleach them and refine them and turn them into white flour nobody does that right so on your own 
farm, if you had your own little farm, right? Um, you would eat those grains, but it wouldn't be in that way. So that would be my best des description of a real diet. The dark side of fat loss covers any bases that I just missed. So, um, yeah, on the flip side, I won't spend much time on this slide, but you know, what makes an unhealthy diet, right? We talked about a, a, a healthy one previously, so I'm not going to get back into that. But what makes an unhealthy diet, right? Because that's a fair question. We talk about, okay, what's a healthy diet? What does it look like? Let's identify what an unhealthy diet is, right? And so quite often we are exposed to opportunities in our food supply to really make unhealthy choices, right? Um, I know at CSU Stanislaus, there's a lot of you that commute, right? And I remember from semesters teaching there that I had students coming in from Merced, um, definitely lots of you coming in from Modesto. Um, and we would talk about, yeah, so what do you eat on a regular basis? Oh, well, you know, I drive in from Merced, so on my way to school, stop at whatever McDonald's and get my breakfast. Um, I'm on campus. So I don't really eat lunch. I might go to a vending machine and get a soda and a, and a, and a Snickers bar, right? And on the way home, I'll stop at uh, Burger King because it's just on my way home to Merced, right? Why is that? Is it because that's what they really want to eat, wanted to eat? Probably not, right? It's because that's what's most convenient and accessible. And so quite often unhealthy diets are fall victim to what we have available to us and what's most convenient. And we'll, we'll get into that this semester quite a bit. Um, we'll get into, yeah, pro highly processed, unbalanced sort of macronutrient profiles, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so strategies to build a healthy diet. And this is at least a piece that I will spend a second talking about. So, you know, ultimately when we design the healthy diet, you know, we need to know what to choose. And your one of your first assignments, I think it's your second one, um, is this grocery store assignment, right? And so I've learned over the years, it's like, yeah, we need to be able to walk into a grocery store and actually know how to choose the right food. Because you're not going to eat something in your house that you didn't buy. So if you're going to the grocery store and going, you know what, I'm loving those Fruit Loops and the Twinkies and everything else. Yeah, that's what you're going to end up eating. And so knowing what to buy is that first step. And so, you know, I always like to encourage people to go to farmer's markets. You can't, it's hard to go wrong at farmer's markets, generally speaking, right? Um, general rules, you know, closest to nature, raw, organic, fresh, grass fed when it comes to animals that might eat grass or pasture raised is another way to describe that. Local, in season, you know, all catch terms or catch phrases that um, are appropriate. Preparing your food is the next step. Cooking is a huge deal and you cooking for yourself or at least, you know, someone in your household cooking, your partner, your roommate, whatever it is, by far the best. Going out and letting other people cook food for you at restaurants and other places, firstly, you don't know what they're doing to it for the most part. You know, there's some restaurants are getting better at it. Um, so cooking for yourself is best. We can absolutely ruin food, though, by overcooking it or not knowing how to prepare it. So um, general rule of thumb, less is best, but there's so much to talk about in that world. But, you know, preparing food right will make a difference. Um, when to eat, this is an easy one, although it's quite often ignored. We should eat when we're hungry. We should stop when we're full. Um, again, understanding those signals, that's the next chapter when we talk about digestion. So um, where we eat is important, too. Peaceful, mindful eating. It is actually really important. That is your first assignment. It's an easy one. Um, it's a mindful eating exercise. Force yourself to have one mindful meal and you'll notice the difference. And it's like, oh yeah, my body will respond differently to that type of food or that type of eating environment. So um, we'll finish with this lecture with food labels. Um, one of the many tools that we have available to us is food labels when it comes to understanding the foods that we're choosing. Ultimately, I'm always arguing, yeah, we should maybe be buying foods that don't have labels. That would be fresh vegetables, fruits, and meats, and not always dairy. Um, so, you know, hey, those unlabeled foods mean that must they must be fresh. Um, but quite often that's not realistic, right? We can't live off a non-labeled food product. So food labels, understanding how to look at them is important. So the, some of the things that must be included on a food label, statement of identity, what food is it, um, the contents of the package, how much is in this entire package. They also give serving size issue, uh, information, which we'll talk about next. Um, an ingredient list. The ingredient list always goes from the, the ingredient that's in the highest volume to the lowest volume. So you see the most prominent ingredient first. Um, manufacturer's name and address must be on there. And so you should be able to have the means to contact whoever made the product to Share some information with them if you want to. Um, and then there's the nutrition facts label. And that's where most people look 
first. And so the nutrition facts label um, looks something like this still. And this is a label that's about 10 years old. And they keep the government keeps m making very, very small changes. And this is a government uh, uh, controlled label, right? You can't just make up your own nutrition facts label. And so there's been discussions about making major changes to it, but they haven't come. So this is a quite old label, but it's still useful. So the nutrition facts label looks like this. One thing to be mindful of, and we'll just start from the top. Um, the very top has a serving size. And so this box of macaroni and cheese has four servings in it and each serving is three and a half ounces. So that would be, if you ate the whole box of macaroni and cheese, you'd be eating four servings of it. Makes sense, right? Nobody can eat just one serving of mac and cheese, right? Um, and now all the information below that first sort of solid thick line there is information per serving. So amount per serving. And so all nutrition facts labels will have information related to calories. So in this case, 320 calories per serving. So if you ate the whole box, you'd be eating like somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,280 calories, right? Um, calories from fat used to be required. That's been removed the last couple of years. So you may or may not see that on the nutrition facts label. Um, manufacturers can put additional information on them, but the stuff that's not required doesn't need to be on there. So this is not required anymore. But again, some manufacturers may just keep it on there still. Um, and then we have the information in this next segment. So this is the segment that describes both percent daily value and then also the amounts of certain nutrients. And so we have total fat. Um, in this case, it tells us 10 grams. That's not 10 grams per box, that's 10 grams per serving. So if you get the whole box, you'd have 40 grams of fat. And in that one serving, the estimated percent daily value you're getting is 15, which basically means and that brings us down to this section down here. This is saying if you eat a 2,000 calorie a day diet, so if you're that person who fits the perfect 2,000 calorie a day caloric needs, that the, this fat based on the government's recommendations for fat consumption um, would satisfy 15% of your fat needs. If you ate the whole box, we'd multiply that by four, which means we'd have 40 grams of fat, which in this case would be 60% of your daily need for fat. Those are government numbers. Those are not what I'm going to suggest throughout this class. Those are all going to be a little bit different, but this is, you know, FDA kind of stuff. Um, so moving down, we have things like saturated fat, cholesterol. Cholesterol is going to be removed as well, although that still may remain on some labels. Sodium is still on there. Um, carbohydrates, yeah, and then they will break carbohydrates down. You'll still see that on current nutrition facts labels. Um, fiber will be on there and sugars will be on there, both of them. Um, and so, and then finally protein, right? And protein's not broken down to anything, it just stays as protein. And so all these numbers, all these percentages are based on their estimated needs. If you're on a 2000 calorie a day diet, most of us aren't. Um, nutrition facts labels will also include information on these micronutrients, vitamin A, calcium, vitamin C, and iron. Um, you'll see some that provide more, it's great. Um, and again, these are based on the average individual's needs for these vitamins and minerals. Athletes will typically need more of these. So again, these, these percent daily value numbers should always be taken very cautiously and applied to an individual's needs, which doesn't always match up with what's on the label. So um, yeah, so that's the Nutrition Facts label. That's the end of lecture one. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.